Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to, of course, good afternoon to our participants here in Bali uh, and to those participating via live stream. So I'm Zoe Trohanis. I'm a lead disaster risk management specialist at the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery uh, and Reconstruction at the World Bank. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this session on institutional arrangements for managing complex crises. So I'll be your host today, uh, accompanied by our distinguished panelists representing UNDP, uh, South Sudan, Indonesia, and India. So we have about an hour for this session, and there will be an opportunity at the end for you to ask questions to our panelists. So now I would like to invite our distinguished panelists to come up to the stage. Uh, so Mr. Ronald Jackson, Head DRR and Recovery for Building Resilience Team from UNDP. Come on up. <laughs> I believe we also have joining uh, from India online, Mr. Krishna Vatsa, member NDMA, Government of India. Welcome. We also have Pat Jarwansa, Deputy of Rehabilitation and Reconstruction at the National Disaster Management Authority of Indonesia. Welcome. And then we have uh, Mr. Banak Joshua Dewal, Director General of Disaster Management of South Sudan. Thank you, everybody. So just as we get started, I wanted to frame the discussion very quickly. And in this session, we will explore issues around the importance of institutions and managing compounding risks. Recent crises, including the COVID-19 pandemic, have exposed weaknesses in the systems, in our systems, and compounded social, political, and economic inequalities, thereby increasing our vulnerabilities. And they pose complex, multi-dimensional challenges that require systemic solutions. So how countries' institutions are set up to respond recover and rebuild from these challenges will play a critical role in the recovery process. And especially important are elements related to coordination across institutions at the national, local, and community levels, as well as their ability to mobilize and manage resources effectively and to build their capacity and flexibility to respond. So with that, I would like to ask Mr. Ronald Jackson, who will be giving the keynote, uh, to come up and kick things off. Thank you very much, um, Zoe. It's certainly a pleasure to again join the collective and to reflect on this issue of institutional arrangements for managing complex crisis. I think this is certainly one of the important, along with, with governance, which this fits fits with quite nicely, uh, one of the very important elements we, ha we have to focus on. I have a quick PowerPoint presentation, so it's not necessarily a classic keynote speech. It's a keynote presentation that will help me through this particular process. So it's entitled Institutional Arrangements for Managing Complex Risk. And I think the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what's an institution? I mean, we use the term quite often, and for many of us, you know, when we think of an institution, we think of an organization, whether it is UNDP, World Bank, we think of practices, we think of customs. And if we apply that same thinking to the conversation we're, we're, we're having this, this, this last two days on recovery, then we're really talking about an ecosystem of actors and arrangements focused on delivering, not just immediately, um, I have a presentation, hopefully it will come up so that you can, you can follow me as I go. Um, not just immediately after an adverse event, but which have worked in unison to anticipate, prevent, prepare, and to recover from these types of situations. We might ask ourselves, why, why, are, why does institutions matter so much when we're next Two slides, please. Why does institutions matter so much when we are looking at this issue of recovery? Next, next slide. Well, in this sense, it's important that there are institutional systems in place equipped with the 
the requisite norms and established practices, and I would want to say more comprehensive norms and practices, um, that makes these processes faster, more inclusive, and agile, depending on the context with which we're op operating. It allows us to do better monitoring and learning and to build that into, into this loop around how we design, deliver, and implement. And this should be done across all aspects of, of the system to ensure that there is systematization, it's a term we often use, of the lessons that we, you know, we, we, we gather from the field as our institutional processes and practices are applied. Next slide. So, what are some of the challenges we, we, we face within, within this particular context? And I have some on the screen you can, you can sample. But there are inherent political economy challenges that we face in, in institutions, in the management of some of the challenges related to, to recovery. And we have to spend some time to understand them and to figure how we navigate those particular political economy challenges. Both both in organizations themselves, but also as part of the wider ecosystem of, of institutional recovery. There are social challenges, so people's perceptions and cultural ties. Um, you know, when we're talking about relocating people, these are some challenges that we face that we have to, again, also engage and, and grapple with. There are issues of trust, both in terms of the state and state institutions that are called on to address this particular issue. And we've heard from the session earlier, but also read thread through many of the discussion, the, the big challenge of financing, financing within institutions, financing of institutions, and the broader financing of some of the institutional ambitions as I talked about those ecosystems. Human resources, both in terms of knowledge, experience, and the numbers to be able to rapidly scale up and deliver on these broad um, ambitions we have, these, these bold goals and ambitions. Next, next slide. So as we think through success, what does success look like? What are the key factors? Uh, you know, legal frameworks, you know, we, we, we have to look at how we are codifying the functions and powers of the implementing institutions, including the scope of any rulemaking authority we have to clarify the funding mechanisms and establish a lifespan for these institutions. Leadership is critical. Talk about leadership for recovery. In any institution, either as a standalone as part of a broader state apparatus, recovery institution has to be empowered. Their power has to be clear and clearly articulated within the context of their mandate, the appointment of an experience and inform leader at the helm of those processes that is able to manage not only from a strategic level but also from a tactical level and to bring the requisite skill sets to the process. And then a very important element that, that should never be overlooked is this whole issue of engagement and participation. Stakeholder engagement and participation and, and not to be left out are those we consider to be most vulnerable who are at the, the front of these you know, um, events that are triggers as we like to call them. Here, successful recovery strategies should not be informed solely by a top-down problem solving on the part of technocrats like ourselves, but should engage the local population, those likely to be affected, and to draw in indigenous knowledge. So we have to engage widely. Good governance, and we saw where, where there were weaknesses in governance in, in, in national systems and national institutions. We saw how some countries fared in, with COVID, where there were good governance. We saw a quick move towards recovery initiatives and recovery interventions. So good governance, a policy group, or other review mechanisms may be set up with the authority to provide regular oversight. And then there are issues around accountability and good financial management that needs to be taken into consideration here and then linkage to financing mechanisms. Successful institutional arrangements usually influence how recovery resources are allocated for projects and programs, both at a geographic level or a sectoral level. 
At the other extreme, institutional arrangements may give lead institutions full authority to manage recovery budget in part or full, requiring that lead institution to have the capacities necessary in procurement, financial management, and contracting. So what are some of the good practices we've seen? Next slide, please. Communication, uh, you know, where we have good communication and the provision of accurate information, we see greater progress towards achieving targets and meeting the objectives outlined in our, in our respective policies. This is particularly important for complex large-scale initiatives. Consider a dedicated comms person and a communication strategy, a strategic one at that, creating targeted information for different audiences. And, and again, throughout these last two days, we've been hearing the need for us to nuance our message to different target groups. Good practices, leveraging existing capacities. Next, next slide, please. Beginning, at the beginning of the recovery process, over the longer term, it is important to invest in building or rebuilding local capacities that may have been depleted or devastated due to the disaster. So even if we're putting in an institution that has a sunset legislation, it has to be linked to ensuring that we are rebuilding or bringing in those capacities that are required if we're talking about using recovery as a pathway to resilience building. We need to clarify rules, promote sustainable development, and it has to also be based on the needs of the affected area. Next slide, please. So what are some of the options we could consider? And I won't go through them because I am mindful of time. We have four particular options we could consider in this regard. The key question is, where do we start? And we have to start by looking at uh, doing an, 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 an important institutional assessment. Next slide. So there are three option models that we can propose if we're looking at an institutional approach. Strengthening our, and coordinating existing line ministries and our local authorities. Establishing a new agency or a hybrid approach. There's no one size approach. It really depends on the context of the, the, the country, the systems that exist as to what model works best. The principle that must be maintained, however, is that it must be towards building stronger institutions at the end of it. Strong institutions are the foundations on which we build sound development. Next slide. In closing, I wanted to take this opportunity as we talked about institution to launch or relaunch our handbook. This handbook is informed by the analysis of six case studies, Chile, Indonesia, India, New Zealand, Serbia, and Mozambique, and presents key elements for success and good practices. The key driver behind the handbook is our strong collective desire to see countries and communities recover quickly and become more resilient through a path facilitated by the most appropriate and robust institutional arrangements. We hope this handbook will inform efforts of government and international agencies to plan institutions for recovery and leadership for a successful recovery process. Ladies and gentlemen, I commend the Handbook on Recovery Institutions, a guide for good practices for recovery leaders and practitioners. Thank you very much. And over to you, Zoe. I'm going to try the microphone. Can you guys hear me? Yes. OK, thank you very much, Ronald. Um, up next, I believe we have uh, Mr. Krishna Vatsa online. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe uh, uh, the um, presentation would be uploaded. Or do I share the presentation? I send the presentation well in advance. Yes, the presentation should be uploaded. I look to our IT colleagues.
Here we go. It's on the screen. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to this conference. And it's wonderful to be linked and connected with the community dedicated to recovery. You know, we have worked in this area for a long time and it's always good to come together and discuss some of these long standing issues, which have very serious implications for the pra practice of recovery, how it has been, had, how it has evolved and been refined and how it has delivered results for us. Uh, to begin with, uh, let, can we go to the next slide? Um, the discussion and debate around the institutional design, uh, which is the subject of the discussion today, is very much uh, influenced by how the practice of recovery has evolved over years. The international frameworks the, and also the the uh, development of recovery within a country have, have influenced the design as well as the working of these institutions. So far as recovery is concerned, uh, it is a late imprint to the disaster management cycle. If you look at the different international strategies over a period of time, Yokohama, Yogo, and Sendai, uh, recovery don't, doesn't find a mention in Yokohama strategy. It actually it is relief that was mentioned there. In Hyogo framework also, there was no mention recovery. Uh, I think the elements of some uh, database related to recovery was mentioned in Hyogo. It was only in the Sendai framework 2015 that recovery was recognized as a pillar of disaster management. And I think it, it did have a significant bearing on how recovery was perceived within countries as well. Can we go to the next slide? So if we look at uh, uh, the the practice of recovery within the countries. You uh, next slide. Yeah, well, you would find that within disaster management legislation, not much reference has been made to recovery. I and mean, it's it's mentioned one or two sentences, but across the countries, recovery was not recognized as a significant uh, aspect of disaster management. Similarly, uh, there was no broad national policy framework for recovery. Whenever there would be a large scale disaster, the government would announce a policy, but it would not extend to all the disasters. There is no committed financial window for recovery. Government would make a provision for recovery as and when a disaster happened, but it would always ignore smaller disasters. And as a result, there were non-existent institutional and technical capacities for recovery. Recovery was very, very program specific. Whenever there is a disaster, the programs would be set up and the governments would policies, allocate resources and uh, set up the necessary institution for implementation. It was a space that was largely occupied by the international actors, particularly the development banks, the World Bank and the regional development banks, the governments always borrowed for supporting recovery programs. These were all one-off programs. They were aimed at particular regions which, were, which was affected by disaster. And when the programs concluded, the institutions were wound up. So it did not really lead to a long lasting national capacity for recovery. So uh, an absence of a very uh, strong policy and institutional framework for recovery made recovery basically a very program specific intervention. That situation of course is now changing. Next slide. 
so uh, in india we we formulated large number of recovery programs uh, during the last 30 years i have mentioned some of them it's not an exhaustive list i think uh, um, another there are, there could be another five six programs all of them were funded by the world bank and asian development bank and they were large scale programs uh, and again uh, they were targeted at a specific states but as soon as the program ended all these uh, institutions that were set up were uh, wound up most of them uh, i will uh, show it through the next slide let can we go to the next slide yeah so there were three uh, three different kinds of institutions that were set up to implement recovery programs the first was the project, project management units pmus they were set up and uh, to implement the program and then it, it was closed after the project was concluded the second uh, category was that of a legislation backed disaster management authority so a state set up the disaster management authority it happened in the state of odisha and gujarat they were to function on a long term basis so they were not to be wound up and the idea was that these authorities would develop long term capacities and continue uh, even after the program was wound up the third category was of special agencies they were created under companies or societies act they were little more independent of the government but they could continue they could continue or they could be discontinued after the project so we had three different types of projects uh, three different types of institutional uh, designs um to implement recovery programs next now so far as the experience of these three different kinds of uh, uh, institutional categories is concerned pmus uh, work quite well with the world bank projects however always face the leadership deficiency um the uh, in the initial stage the government provided a lot of support but then there would be fast turnover of the leadership and also the staff so it posed serious challenges to the pmu over time disaster management authorities had better political leadership more uh, participation and more ownership of the state governments but once the projects ended they faced the mandate deficiency the long term viability of these disaster management authorities emerged as an important as a significant challenge and then the special agencies set up under this companies and societies act they found it difficult to Uh, work with the line departments they all be just stood little outside the government so while they had some strengths it was difficult to integrate them formally into the government and coordinate more effectively with their line departments slide so what is important is that all these institutions found it difficult to implement a large wide range of very demanding and complex challenges they had to be set up in a very short time frame they had to carry out a large number of functions procurement planning engineering all kinds of development activities that needed to be brought together and recovery was not a single sector activity it was always a multi sector program so all the sectors need to be brought together the agencies responsible for these sectors need to be coordinated with the fund flow would be very very and in a very short period of time and in a government setup there would always be uh, this culture of risk aversion so 
it was very very difficult to deliver all the recovery programs in a short period of time pursuing all the objectives and bringing the dividends of recovery program in an equitable manner next uh, sorry krishna we're time's yes. up on this one if you could please in one one minute or so wrap up your presentation yeah i will i will finish in two minutes so you know so recovery actually uh, we uh, you know, it, it reflects the internal uh, inherent strengths of the government. We have to get the leadership, financial planning, coordination and implementation together. And if the governmental systems are not very strong, then bringing these elements together is always a challenge. Next. So what is important is that the institutions need to uh, advocate strongly, for improved uh, specifications and better so that they can promote resilience. They should also bring in more cross-cutting themes, environment, gender, social equity, community participation. All these things are need to be assimilated in a recovery program. And in a, in a recovery program of a you know, well-defined time frame, it's uh, with all the people to be brought together in a very, very short period of time, these often become highly challenging. Next. So what is important now is that we need to invest more in recovery preparedness. You know, this, this whole experiment of setting up institution and wounding up after the recovery program is concluded, that's not really uh, 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 working anymore. We need to have recovery institutions on a long-term basis. Uh, we need to develop national capacities in this area, which means that we need to develop policy framework, assessment methods, planning, implementation modalities, so that recovery becomes a, a, you know, a regular feature of the disaster management uh, cycle. It's not something that is set up and then wound up you know, after a program is concluded. So we need to have permanent long-standing institutions to, to plan and, and implement recovery. And it's, uh, uh, unless we do that, we would be facing very, very serious challenges in all the countries across the world, whether it is the you know, countries in the Caribbean or Mozambique or Nepal or India, all of them are facing these serious capacity challenges. Next. So what is important is that uh, we, uh, uh, there should be a global support for this kind of recovery preparedness. You know, it's time that 2008 tripartite agreement is revisited and we need to expand the scope of this collaboration to include recovery on the ground. So we should have much better recovery preparedness through a global initiative and UNDP and World Bank should lead this initiative. Next. In India, also, we have now, uh, as part of this, we have set up a committed window of funding for recovery and reconstruction. We have $2 billion almost every year. We, are, we, we, are, we have now framed the re national recovery and reconstruction guidelines. We are setting up a national recovery and resource center at the national level, and we want to set up a recovery and reconstruction unit in all the state disaster management authorities. So this is the direction in which we are moving so that recovery becomes long standing and uh, it becomes a very important part of our disaster management system. I think this is the direction in which we need to move. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation, Krishna. Okay, so our next speaker I'd like to introduce uh, is Pa Jarwansa, who will speak in Bahasa. So if you need, we have interpretation. Thank you, Joy. Everybody, good afternoon. Om Swastiastu. Salam. Good bless. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My slide. Ya, 
Institutional Arrangement for Managing Conflict Crisis Indonesia Friend in Managing COVID-19. Pengaturan kelembagaan untuk mengelola krisis kompleks pengalaman Indonesia dalam mengelola COVID-19. Hadirin sekalian yang berbahagia, sebelum saya masuk ke inti paparan, mungkin eh, perlu kami sampaikan untuk praktek baik pengalaman Indonesia dalam mengelola COVID secara singkat, bahwa kami di Indonesia memiliki penduduk kurang lebih 273,5 juta jiwa. Selama COVID berlangsung, ada 6,05 juta kasus yang kita uh, alami, uh, sembuh 5,9 juta, dan ada 157 ribu meninggal dunia. Banyak negara di luar Indonesia yang mungkin barangkali tidak percaya kenapa kita, bangsa Indonesia, mampu mengendalikan COVID dengan luas Indonesia yang terdiri dari banyak penduduk dan negara dengan kepulauan. Ada empat hal, next slide, ya. Ada empat hal poin diskusi kita pada sore hari ini. Yang pertama adalah pendekatan penanggulangan bencana dalam mengelola pandemi. Yang kedua, respon menuju ke pemulihan, recovery. Yang ketiga, pengalaman menangani Palu dan Lombok yang kasus gempa, bencana alam, dalam pemulihan, dalam situasi pandemi, dan yang terakhir, yang keempat, refleksi dan kesempatan belajar. Next slide. Pasti pertama respon COVID-19. Pemerintah, government, menunjuk BNPB sebagai koordinator gugus, gugus tugas percepatan penanganan COVID-19. Diatur dengan peraturan Presiden nomor 9 tahun 2020 tentang perubahan atas peraturan Presiden nomor 7 tahun 2020 tentang percepatan gugus tugas penanganan coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19. Ada tiga kata kunci pemerintah yang kita laksanakan selama ini untuk eh, menangani bencana alam dan juga bencana non-alam dalam hal ini pandemi. Pertama, penguatan dalam hal koordinasi. Kedua, penguatan dalam hal komando. Yang ketiga, penguatan dalam hal pelaksanaan. Kemudian, fase pertama juga dalam respon COVID-19 adalah untuk menegaskan kewenangan gugus tugas, pemerintah menerbitkan Peraturan Presiden nomor 12 tahun 2020 tentang penetapan bencana non-alam, penyebaran coronavirus 2019 COVID-19 sebagai bencana nasional. Kemudian yang ketiga, status bencana nasional memberikan legitimasi kepada Satgas Satuan Tugas untuk mengambil langkah-langkah dan kebijakan strategis yang diperlukan dalam menghadapi situasi pandemi. Next slide. Pembentukan gugus tugas sangat penting. Pembentukan Satgas ini sangat penting mengingat ancaman penyebaran COVID-19 yang semakin meningkat dan jumlah korban jiwa serta dampaknya terhadap sosial, ekonomi, dan kesejahteraan sosial. Organisasi Kesehatan Dunia, WHO, telah menyatakan COVID-19 sebagai pandemi global pada 11 Maret 2020. Dampak COVID-19 yang perlu ditangani secara sinergis antar kementerian lembaga yang berbeda, serta antara pemerintah pusat dan daerah. Next slide. Struktur gugus tugas COVID-19. Gugus tugas terdiri dari perwakilan berbagai sektor dan bertanggung jawab langsung kepada Presiden Indonesia. Susunan Satgas mulai dari tingkat nasional hingga provinsi dan juga kabupaten kota. Lembaga ini terdiri dari dua komponen utama, ada Dewan Pengarah, ada Dewan Eksekutif. Dewan Pengarah bertanggung jawab untuk sisi kebijakan, polisi, dan badan eksekutif. Di bawah kepemimpinan Kepala BNPB bertanggung jawab untuk mengembangkan dan mengimplementasikan rencana respon terhadap pandemi. Di bawah BNPB sebagai Satgas dibentuk sekretariat untuk memberikan dukungan teknis dan bantuan administrasi 
kepada gugus tugas percepatan penanganan COVID-19. Selanjutnya, next slide. Prom respon to recovery. Gugus tugas yang fungsi utamanya adalah tanggap darurat terhadap situasi krisis. Dibubarkan saat itu seiring dengan pergeseran strategi pemerintah Indonesia untuk menyeimbangkan antara respon krisis kesehatan dan pemulihan ekonomi. Pendekatan baru tersebut dipimpin oleh Komite Penanganan COVID-19 dan Pemulihan Ekonomi Nasional yang diatur melalui Peraturan Presiden Nomor 82 Tahun 2020 dan diaktifkan pada 20 Juli 2020. Pemerintah melihat pandemi berdampak besar pada sosial, ekonomi, dan kesejahteraan secara luas dan upaya pemulihan kasus harus dilakukan secara strategis memastikan bahwa kebijakan disusun secara sinkron dan terintegrasi. Next slide. Saudara-saudara sekalian, Indonesia merupakan salah satu negara yang paling rawan bencana alam menurut World Risk Index tahun 2016. Ada risiko menghadapi beban ganda bencana, bencana alam dan bencana non-alam dalam hal ini COVID-19. Pelajaran yang dapat dipetik dari penanganan COVID-19 di negara rawan bencana, salah satunya adalah Indonesia. Next slide. Intervensi di daerah dengan beban ganda bencana, kita kategorikan kepada dua. Pertama, COVID-19 diikuti oleh bencana alam. Itu kita contohkan adalah Kalimantan Selatan, di mana saat itu terjadi banjir, dan juga Sulawesi Barat yang saat itu terjadi gempa. Kemudian yang kedua, bencana alam diikuti oleh COVID-19. Ini ada di Sulawesi Tengah, beberapa kabupaten kota, Palu, Donggala, Sigi, kemudian Nusa Tenggara Barat, Lombok, NTB. Next slide. Terkait dengan hal ini, maka kita memperbaharui, mengupdate kembali protokol tanggap bencana. Sebagai bagian dari langkah-langkah kesiapsiagaan, ada kebutuhan untuk memastikan bahwa protokol utama untuk kesiapsiagaan telah diperbaharui untuk mencerminkan situasi pandemi. Kemudian, Kementerian Sosial dalam hal ini sebagai lembaga pemerintah yang memimpin untuk penampungan dan perlindungan selama keadaan darurat telah mengeluarkan pedoman evakuasi dan manajemen camp di bawah COVID-19. Kemudian Basarnas, SAR, Badan Pencarian dan Pertolongan, mengeluarkan pedoman baru untuk operasi penyelamatan darurat selama pandemi. Sementara itu BNPB sendiri sebagai Satgas bersama BMKG dan mitra lainnya juga menyiapkan pedoman evakuasi tsunami dalam situasi COVID-19 yang lebih menekankan pada protokol kesehatan. Next slide. Kemudian bagaimana menjembatani kesenjangan informasi? Ini hal penting, ada tantangan seperti kesenjangan digital, akses ke informasi umum dan lain-lain dalam proses komunikasi risiko yang menyulitkan masyarakat untuk mengambil tindakan dalam menanggapi COVID-19. Upaya peningkatan pemahaman dan kesiapsiagaan dilakukan dengan mengintensifkan komunikasi, sosialisasi, dan edukasi melalui pendekatan keluarga dan lingkungan. Indonesia memiliki dua program yang dapat dimanfaatkan, dua program yang digunakan untuk tujuan tersebut, yaitu gerakan bersama keluarga kita atau berjarak yang dicanangkan oleh KPPA, Kementerian Perempuan dan Anak, dan program Keluarga Tangguh Bencana atau Katana yang dilaksanakan oleh BNPB yang dibentuk jauh sebelum pandemi COVID-19 ada. Katana telah digagas oleh BNPB sebelum pandemi dan ditujukan untuk menekan angka kematian saat terjadi bencana melalui penguatan pemahaman di lingkungan keluarga dan masyarakat. Dalam konteks pandemi COVID-19, Katana menyertakan kampanye pencegahan COVID-19 di rumah dengan memberikan tugas kepada anggota keluarga dalam rencana kesiapsiagaan keluarga seperti penerapan 3M, memakai masker, mencuci tangan pakai sabun, dan juga menjaga jarak. Selain itu, di bawah hotline Katana, 
juga disosialisasikan kontak-kontak seperti nomor anggota keluarga yang berbeda, nomor telepon, perangkat RTRW, tim siaga COVID-19, dan fasilitas kesehatan rujukan. Next slide. Praktek baik yang lain yang perlu kami sampaikan adalah terkait dengan mempercepat penggunaan teknologi untuk menyampaikan program dan intervensi. Dengan keterbatasan interaksi fisik dalam situasi pandemi, penggunaan teknologi perlu dipercepat agar program dan intervensi dapat tersampaikan. Restore peningkatan fitur aplikasi yang relevan dengan COVID-19. Kita di BNPB punya Inaris dan Span Lapor. Penyempurnaan aplikasi Span Lapor melalui pengembangan dan integrasi fitur monitoring mekanisme penanganan pengaduan, database segregasi gender, dan profil lapor pengguna berdasarkan usia. Kemudian proyek ini telah mendukung BNPB untuk mengembangkan fitur baru alat penilaian mandiri risiko COVID-19 yang tertanam di Inaris. Aplikasi pribadi mengikuti setiap input data. Aplikasi dapat memvisualisasikan tingkat risiko covid pengguna di lingkungan mereka, dan rekomendasi tindakan. Informasi yang dikumpulkan diproses dan dianalisis oleh Inaris System, kemudian divisualisasikan di dashboard COVID-19 dan portal Inaris. Hingga Mei 2022, subaplikasi self-assessment COVID-19 telah digunakan hampir 100.000 orang di 13.692 desa di 34 provinsi di seluruh Indonesia. Data self-assessment terintegrasi dengan data kerentanan dan kapasitas berbasis geopasial yang dikumpulkan oleh tim Inaris Dashboard dapat diakses pada http inaris to bnpb go id dashboard covid. Kemudian memulihkan peningkatan aplikasi melalui cash for work. Aplikasi ini awalnya dikembangkan oleh UNDP untuk mengelola intervensi cash for work di Provinsi Suteng, Sulawesi Tengah, di bawah proyek Restore, UNDP telah bekerjasama dengan Kementerian Desa untuk meningkatkan aplikasi dengan menyesuaikan sistemnya untuk beroperasi dalam konteks COVID-19 dan BLT DD, Bantuan Langsung Tunai Dana Desa. Sejumlah fitur aplikasi ditingkatkan termasuk digitalisasi pendataan, formulir asensi dan sistem pembayaran. Ah, uh, sorry, time's up. One minute. Okay. Again. Okay. Uh, next slide. Pelajaran dari pemulihan, intervensi yang kita lakukan kita punya Jitu Pasna, rencana pemulihan R3P untuk bahaya COVID, pengembangan ekonomi lokal, pengelolaan puing-puing melalui cash for work dan percontohan pembiayaan inovatif untuk perlindungan sosial. Next slide. Pelajaran yang dipetik dari pemulihan ini adalah keberhasilan dan kecepatan respon dikaitkan dengan kehadiran lokal UNDP dan atau mitra yang ditetapkan oleh UNDP sebagai respon pertama. Kemudian ada kemitraan dengan para mitra lokal, kemudian efek dan respon terhadap COVID-19 berlangsung secara bersamaan. Ada penguatan kapasitas di tingkat lokal perlu dilembagakan. Itu pelajaran yang bisa kita petik dari pemulihan. Next slide. Bapak-Ibu sekalian, kita tahu bahwa di Indonesia ada proyek Petra yang kita laksanakan di Lombok, Nusa Tenggara Barat, dan juga e, Palu untuk kegiatan-kegiatan fisik, baik itu fasilitas kesehatan maupun juga fasilitas pendidikan. Next slide. Next slide. Refleksi praktik yang baik di pemerintah nasional, kita sudah menyusun kebijakan dan peraturan untuk pemulihan pasca bencana, dan kita juga sudah mengatur mekanisme penyaluran dana hibah untuk e, pemulihan. Ada fleksibilitas, ada transparansi, ada akuntabilitas dalam pelaksanaan pengawasan. Next slide berikutnya. Ini contoh-contoh eksampel e, kerjasama dengan e, UNDP. Next slide. Terakhir e, sebagai conclusion, kesimpulan, BNPB yang ditunjuk oleh Presiden Republik Indonesia sebagai koordinator gugus tugas percepatan penanganan COVID-19 di Indonesia berupaya sekuat tenaga memberdayakan kemampuan seluruh komponen sumber daya manusia bangsa agar secara sinergis menghadapi dampaknya dari COVID-19. 
Kedua, koordinasi dan komunikasi antara pemerintah pusat dan daerah selalu dimaksimalkan agar seluruh elemen bangsa bergerak bersama dalam satu tujuan menghadapi pandemi ini. Ketiga, keberagaman masyarakat Indonesia dengan berbagai kondisi, upaya, dan kearifan lokal memunculkan berbagai keunikan dan kreativitas dalam penanganan pandemi. Indonesia melaksanakan berbagai upaya pencegahan, revitalisasi, dan inovasi dilakukan baik oleh pemerintah pusat maupun pemerintah daerah. Dan yang terakhir, pelonggaran aktivitas ekonomi yang menggerakkan dinamika aktivitas masyarakat bahkan dengan himbauan untuk lebih mematuhi protokol kesehatan memiliki konsekuensi besar terhadap potensi risiko penularan, penularan dan penyebaran COVID-19. Terima kasih, thank you. Thank you, terima kasih Pak. Okay, so for our last speaker, I'd like to welcome Banak Joshua Dewal to the podium. I hope I will be able to save time for questions. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good, um, good afternoon. Uh, I just want to bring uh, to you today the uh, perspective uh, on the institutional uh, arrangement for managing complex crises in South Sudan. I'm not sure whether you have a slide to be... There is there is presentation here? No? Yeah. IAS should be responsible for that, okay. Maybe they try, okay. Okay, so what I will share to you uh, this evening is that the uh, natural hazards, uh, like you all know, are a leading source of risk and um, increasing vulnerabilities, especially in the poor communities, and pose serious uh, obstacle to achieving sustainable development goals, especially social and economic development. For the natural hazards, as we call them, also are, are implicated or compounded by the, the human-induced disasters. So when COVID-19 struck South Sudan or hit South Sudan in April 2020, already the government or the nation was suffering from major flooding that started in 2019. And then we also have the, uh, the invasion of the, uh, the locusts, or what, what we call sometimes the, uh, the, the fall army worm. Then plus the conflict. It's already complete around the country, and then came the COVID-19. So because of the, the long civil war in the country, and I don't want to drag you into the history, because of time, the establishment of the DRM institutions has not been as we expected since we gained independence in 2011. Although we have the policy constructed at the wider community and, and adopted by the government, guided by the principle and goals of the Sendai framework, yet it's still implementation of policy, especially at the grassroots when the COVID-19 hit South Sudan, became problematic. So at the national level, I wish the, my slide would have been uh, displayed so that I save time in terms of uh, showing the structure of the, uh, of the governing system for DRM. So, at the national level, we have the, uh, the system. We have the policy, we have the National Disaster Risk Management Council, which is headed by the head of the state. And then we have the interministerial committee, which is headed by the, my ministry or my minister, which is the, the Minister for Disaster Management. Under this, you have technical working groups. One of the most effective technical working group is the, is the National Technical Working Group on Early Warning System that is comprised of many 
DRM institutions that meets quarterly and then produce a bulletin to reflect on South Sudan main hazards. So when the, the COVID-19 outbreak came, uh, the government decided, the president decided, like my police said, to issue a degree forming, in our perspective, is a political body. But we thought that a political body cannot manage a technical issue like COVID-19. And it was placed in the hand of one, the most powerful first vice president in the country. But in the end, technical committees, task forces were formed. And then we, were, we managed to, to look at the targets that we want to do in the country. In the session in the morning, I announced that the deaths from COVID-19 in South Sudan it stands at 138. Very small number. Well, okay, we are a very small also country in terms of population. And the cases it stand at uh, 17,500. It's still a small number. But we are saying, as a technocrat, that it does not reflect the reality on ground because there were attitudes from, from people, from individuals that resisted testing and that posed a threat to the communities, especially the rural areas. If you don't want to be tested, you are COVID positive, nobody knows, and then you go and mix with other poor people. The other reason is that testing also uh, costs some money. You have to pay for testing. So people refrain from going for testing since it is costly. So the lowest statistics really does not really show that South Sudan control COVID-19 as we would expect it. So with this complex situation in mind, it is difficult to contemplate how South Sudan cope with the management of the COVID-19. So what did we do differently to control COVID-19? This institution, first, like we, we learn how to live with conflict, we got to learn how to live with COVID-19. As other people also got to learn how to live with typhoon, we also got to learn with many complex issues, like what we said before, flooding, locust invasion, conflict, and an outbreak of many other diseases. In the structure, at the state level, we have very strong person of the, what we call the disaster risk management committees. They took an initiative by campaigning from state to state, from county to county, creating awareness. And I want to capture one of the, my uh, speakers who spoke before me, that one of the key in this is communication. But I will not stop short of the communication alone. I will add another three C's, which I usually call them the four C's. Communication is key to reach out to the rural areas, to everybody, such that aware, dissemination. But communication must be supported by coordination of efforts, such that there is no duplications. A lot, a lot of resources are wasted because of lack of coordination. There are no clear responsibilities. People don't know how many NGOs, how many UN agencies, how many agencies want to respond, and then you, you lose resources. The third, cooperation. We need to cooperate, so that we work in a conducive environment. The last one, the fourth, is collaboration. So what we want to, inter what we want to produce at the end of the game, and I, I was saying in the morning that uh, resilient 
you can nourish resilient, which is the last mile of DRR, unless you have key elements. One of them is that you must know risk. So from risk to resilient, I'm saying resilient is not about results. It's about sustainability and ownership. So even if you get the result, and you don't have people owning their project, their power, and they say, if you don't own the power, you don't own the decision. So we must capacitate our communities so that they own the decision. So why doing this? Why we have an organization, we have support from our partners, of our friends, what challenges we encountered, despite all this arrangement. The crisis has been long with us, especially the flooding. So when, the, when COVID-19 struck South Sudan, it found so many people, 2.2 million people displaced. So you can imagine, how would you control 2.2 million people displaced in the country? Insecurity, access has been a problem, compounded by poor infrastructure in the country. So even if you want to reach the most vulnerable population, the issue of access has also posed a problem. The political commitment was not or is not substituted by financing. Finances is an issue in this forum. And I hope we have been talking finances, finances, and I'm saying 2030 is just next door. So when are we going to secure finances? I'm not talking finances from outside. Even the national government, they can afford to finance their DRM initiative. So what are the next steps then? If we have, I have so many challenges, but I thought some of them were mentioned, so they need to repeat them. But so what do we do so that we go out of this? I have many points, but I will pick only two of them. We have to recognize that we are, the only, we, are the only, we are the people on the center of threat, not the next door. If we realize, if we recognize our threat, then we will plan for what we know, not plan for other people. The forces I just mentioned, we are asking our partners, the international community, let them come with the donor regulations. But again, let us learn the context of the country in which they want to serve the most vulnerable people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really interesting presentation. No, so I want to thank our entire panel uh, for the presentations. Unfortunately, we have run over time but we did have quite an interesting set of um, presentations, some discussion. I think my takeaway would be that institutions do matter. They are critical to the recovery process, which is a continuum. And as we heard from our speakers, uh, recovery is not a one-off process. So you need to make sure that the capacity is retained and it's not just national capacity, it's subnational, it's community engagement. I think we heard from various speakers the importance of communication uh, as well. Collab I like the collaboration, all the C's that we heard in the last presentation. And agility, I think that Ronald had also mentioned. And of course, financing and making sure that these issues are prioritized with clear mandates. It's a tall order but we've seen it can be done. And I think that's the beauty of these type of events, to hear from different countries what they've learned. UNDP has also, as well as the World Bank, we've compiled quite a bit of resources, materials, and lessons uh, of what's worked, what hasn't worked, uh, because we always know, sadly, there will be a next time. Hence the importance of maintaining this capacity and this continuum of risk reduction uh, recovery, re reconstruction, hopefully reducing that part on reconstruction and recovery and more on the risk reduction. But I want to thank everyone again. Thank you. Round of applause, guys, for the panel. Good job. 
And I think up next we will have the closing, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. <laughs>